Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is March 6th, 2018. Welcome from downtown Denver, where I am preparing this episode for release on Tuesday night, three days earlier than usual. There are two reasons for this. One is that I leave tomorrow morning, Wednesday, for Austin, Texas, to cover South by Southwest Interactive. I had thought I might put the show together on Friday in Austin, but that would have taken a big bite out of my availability for sessions at the conference. The second reason for putting the show out early is that my guest's latest book, a standalone domestic thriller titled Closer Than You Know, is being released today, March 6, 2018, by Dutton, an imprint of Penguin Random House. I spoke with the author, Brad Parks, yesterday, and I plan to attend a book reading that he happens to be scheduled to give Thursday evening in Austin at the Book People Bookstore, located at 603 North Lamar Boulevard. Brad and I mainly talked about his new book, which I read and thoroughly enjoyed, as well as his previous thrillers. Uh, We talked about how he writes at a local Hardy's restaurant and the problem with modern literature, among other subjects. Along the way, I did venture to touch on the hot topic of ebook pricing. (laughs) That led to a predictable divergence of opinion and a scramble by two writers to recall what they learned in college about supply and demand curves. Well, and and now you are getting into a level of decision making that uh, goes beyond my pay grade. I'm I'm just the dumb guy who writes the books. Somebody else decides how to price them. Uh, First up in news, and this may actually become kind of a regular feature this year, uh, let's look at an update of the Amazon HQ2 sweepstakes. Dan Campbell emailed me a link to a story by Brian Deegan at Investors Business Daily, suggested that Washington, D.C., or the D.C. area, may be the place to beat. Quote, evidence continues to mount that Washington, D.C. is the most likely place where Amazon will build a second headquarters, Deegan began his article. He cited a Washington Post report that Amazon officials had toured sites in D.C. and nearby counties in Maryland and Northern Virginia. The Amazon team had breakfast with Virginia Governor Ralph Northam and dinner with Washington Mayor Muriel Bowser. Uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch yesterday, March 5th, published a list of the top five contenders in alphabetical order. They were Boston, Denver, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Washington. The, the Washington listing there is actually three locations that made the top 20, D.C. itself and the neighboring counties in Maryland and Virginia. Last month, Deegan noted, a PR firm named Hamilton Place Strategies scored the Washington area highest in its analysis of possible HQ2 locations. The D.C. area received a score of 10 in that analysis, followed by Boston scoring 9, Northern Virginia 8.5, and Montgomery County in Maryland 8. Seeing that all three of the D.C. area locations were in that top uh, rankings list, I suspected Hamilton placed strategies of possible local bias, and it turns out that yes, they have an office in Washington, D.C., as well as offices in San Francisco and New York City. And New York, of course, is one of the other uh, contenders in the top 20. The next news story this week stirred my imagination about Amazon's possible participation in blockchain technology, the Internet protocols driving Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. John P. Nujui wrote a piece at a website named Crypto News titled Ripple, XRP, and Amazon would be a match made in crypto heaven. Well, as I've told you, uh, I purchased an Ether, which is uh, the unit of currency for the number two cryptocurrency to Bitcoin, just to see what this thing is about. My Ether has fallen in value, but it's still $92 higher than the $739 I paid for it a month ago. I hadn't heard about Ripple's XRP cryptocurrency, uh, but partly because it doesn't show up on my Coinbase app on my iPhone. That's how what I use to track the uh, ups and downs of the Ether. That may change according to a rumor that briefly boosted the XRP to a higher value, up over a dollar seven for uh, one of those units. There are, it uh, turns out, hundreds, uh, actually, I think over a thousand of these cryptocurrencies loose in the world, and they stir an evangelical level of enthusiasm among their adherents. If you'd like to dip your toe into this subject, I can recommend an hour and a half long interview that Kevin Rose, founder of Dig, did with Andreas M. Antonopoulos, an apparent 
a pioneer and expert in cryptocurrencies. This appeared in episode one of Rose's Block Zero podcast. I'll have a link to it in the show notes uh, for the episode. I found it nearly impossible to follow, but there were enough glimpses of understanding for me to feel it was worthwhile to keep listening. Antonopoulos has written a book that is available for free borrowing if you have Kindle Unlimited. It's titled The Internet of Money, and it comprises transcripts of talks that the author has given around the world on the topic of Bitcoin. So far, I've found his writing to be clearer than the fast-paced conversation that he had with Kevin Rose on the podcast. In any event, this cryptocurrency movement is clearly a thing. One glimpse of understanding I gained is that the blockchain technology enables money to flow via the internet in nearly real time in tiny or huge amounts. You might be able at some point to use it for the purchase of gasoline as your car is burning it, a flow of money from your Bitcoin or other account that takes place for all intents and purposes at exactly the same rate in real time as the fuel is being consumed. With that background, I think I understand the breathless speculation uh, in this crypto news piece. The author was clearly touting one particular cryptocurrency, Ripple's XRP, but the argument that he makes might apply to any of them. He envisions Amazon's using a crypto payment system to smooth operations of its warehouses, streamline its multimodal transportation system, and make payments to individual sellers, such as Kindle Direct Publishing authors, when their products sell on Amazon.com. He argues that Ripple's cryptocurrency is secure, fast, and cheap. Those are characteristics that I assume are shared with competing cryptos. And that Amazon's partnership with Ripple, quote, would accelerate an already efficient Amazon.com operation into a more supercharged one and also more, here he says the magic word, more consumer friendly. I have been scanning the dizzying array of sessions at South by Southwest to find ways to learn about Bitcoin and blockchain technology when I'm in Austin in the coming week. A search for Bitcoin returned 24 results from cryptocurrencies, a new future to money, uh, to Ethereum, creator of Ether, will disrupt everything. By next week's all South by Southwest show, I hope I'm going to be able to bring you an understandable and credible overview of this topic, which does not yet seem to be at the center of the gathering's zeitgeist. Uh, By comparison with those 24 search results for Bitcoin, uh, a search of the the schedule for VR, uh, standing for virtual reality, uh, returned twice as many results, 50 sessions that had to do with VR. More than 70,000 people attended the South by Southwest Interactive Film and Music Conferences last year. Uh, It's an amazing event. I'll be curious to see if that number increases. or It just almost seems like it's maxed out in terms of what Austin can do. They built a a whole other hotel pretty much to handle South by Southwest in in addition to the Austin Convention Center. Uh, but it's just a bustle. They do an amazing job moving people around on shuttles, and there are all kinds of ways to, to get among the different venues. Uh, and there's a lot of walking. That's that's my favorite thing is when I'm going from one uh, event to another, and it's a few blocks to join the throngs on the crowd, everybody with their lanyards and their uh, tags, and uh, it's it's pretty exciting. I will be staying with my cousin Peter. Uh, He lives in the northwest part of town off Far West Boulevard. Uh, He's a great chef. Uh, Tomorrow night, I think I'm, I forget what he has on the menu, probably a big, big piece of beef that he's going to be cooking out on the grill. And then we go out to some local barbecue joints while we're in town. Uh, Peter's been my guest on the show before. He's uh, totally blind, been blind from birth, and he knows a lot about the accessibility issues that Kindle and Amazon deal with on the platform. Uh, And it's amazing to watch him cook a steak in the dark. You can see for yourself what will be on offer at South By if you point your browser to schedule.sxsw.com. If you spot a session that you think might be good for me to include in next week's show, please feel free to email me at podchronicles at gmail.com and I'll take a look. 
Time now for the interview. Brad Parks, who lives in Northern Virginia, is the only writer to have won three prestigious awards for crime fiction, the Seamus, the Nero, and the Lefty Awards. A 1996 graduate of Dartmouth College, he worked as a reporter at the Washington Post and the Newark, New Jersey Star-Ledger before becoming a full-time novelist a decade ago. Brad and I connected by Skype yesterday, March 5th. I began by asking him to read a passage from his new book, Closer Than You Know. Uh, This section is the start of Chapter 2. If you are a working mother, as I am, you know this truth to be self-evident. Good child care, safe, affordable, and reliable, is rarer than flawless diamonds and at least twice as valuable. It is the connective tissue, the breath in your lungs, the essential vitamin that makes all other movement possible. The flip side is that losing your child care, especially when you have an infant, is basically incapacitating. That was the catastrophe I was trying to avert on a Tuesday evening in early March as I sped toward Ida Ferncliff's house with one eye on the road and the other on the clock, which was ticking ominously close to 6 p.m. Mrs. Ferncliff had been watching our now three-month-old son, Alex, since he went into childcare at six weeks. With children and babies, she was as magical as Harry Potter, patient and kind, caring and calm, unflappable in all situations. With adults... She was more like Voldemort. My husband, Ben, referred to her as Der Kaiser, after Kaiser Wilhelm, and not just because of her mustache. She had her rules, which she followed with Teutonic precision, and she expected everyone else to as well. This is how we begin in Melanie Barrick's voice. Uh, Melanie is a young mother, obviously rushing away from her job to pick up her kid at childcare. She arrives there only to learn the child has been taken away by social services and no one will tell her why. Well, and it gets worse than that. How, how Without spoiling anything, uh, give a taste for sort of the, the Job-like trials that poor Melanie goes through very early in this book. Yeah, so she, uh, a- after having the, the shocking horror of no, your kid isn't here, social services has him, Uh, she goes home to find that her house has been raided by the sheriff's office, and they have carried away a half kilo of cocaine that they have found in there. And then the horror only amplifies when she finally gets a meeting with social services the next day, and they tell her they've gotten an anonymous tip that she has been accused of trying to sell her baby on the black market. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty grim. <laughs> it's, it's terrible stuff I do to this poor woman, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. Maybe I'm just trying to assuage my own guilt here, but I would actually come home from writing this book, Len, feeling awful about the things I was doing to this woman. I mean, I, it's, it's not like I was just destroying her life uh, without a care. I, I really did feel terrible for, for the things that I do to Melanie Barrick and Closer Than You Know. Yeah. Well, that probably helps us for, as a reader. You know, there's some empathy for her. And the, the fact that it was hard for you to do all those things to her made it probably more poignant to read. There's another great character, the assistant Commonwealth's attorney, Amy Kay. She's assigned to Melanie's case. Uh, what are her strengths and weaknesses as she enters the the story. So Amy Kay is a no-nonsense prosecutor. She is all about the law. And she's really based on, uh, I was a newspaper reporter for a number of years, and then just kind of became a guy who liked to hang around courthouses sometimes. And you would find these kind of characters who were really almost corny and old-fashioned in their adherence to this thing called the law. And it wasn't so much that they were, I, I think that the modern prosecutor gets portrayed oftentimes in TV as they're all about winning and losing. They're, they're all about getting the crook behind bars. But but I have often found prosecutors who really are looking for a fair and just outcome and understand their role in that whole process. And I think Amy is very much carved out of that tradition. She sees herself as an officer of the court, and she is helping the court to achieve the most just outcome possible. And how about uh, Melanie's attorney? She can't afford to pay for an attorney. Uh, He's quite a character. Where does he come from in your experience? So um, Mr. Honeywell is his name. And um, Len, I'll I'll admit, I'm bad with names sometimes. Uh, So Mr. Honeywell is actually named after my thermostat. Um, But he's... uh, He's based on a guy, and we we might get into this later in the interview. I I write in Hardee's every morning. 
And I was just writing one morning and I realized that Melanie Barrick's lawyer was going to have to come onto the stage. And I look up and I see this sad sack guy. He's got these bulging eyes. He's got bags under his eyes. He's got a big old belly hanging over his, his, his belt. His clothes are stained. And I thought, that is Melanie's ham and egg attorney, Mr. Honeywell, right there. The wonderful thing about Mr. Honeywell, and I ended up enjoying this character so much, is I had no expectations of him whatsoever when he began. But as the story went along, the story kept demanding more of Mr. Honeywell. And suddenly he takes on this outsized role in Melanie's life. And he just became one of those delightfully surprising characters that, that trip upon you now and then in fiction. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed him, too. He was, he was kind of my sneaky favorite character in this book. Well, and I was going to ask you if you're still writing at Hardy's because there was a profile of you a few years ago uh, showing you at your corner table. So I take it you're you still <laughs> that's your practice writing. Now, I am wording. still Hi, Hardy's is still my writing sanctuary. Uh, Len, I was there as recently as about a half an hour ago. So yes, very much still. As a matter of fact, if the, if you see a little bit of a sheen of uh, of secondhand grease on me, it's just because I'm I'm coming straight from the Hardys. Well, and one of the advantages you said was uh, no Wi-Fi, therefore no distractions. Have they still been able to continue that into 2018? There's no Wi-Fi at your Hardys. There is still no Wi-Fi at the Hardys. The other thing is, and uh, I, I know we're we're only getting audio of this, so viewers at home can't see. Let me let me show Len my phone. We're, Len and I are on Skype right now, so he can see. It. Len oh. can testify that I'm showing a circa 2007 flip phone nice. to him right now. So I actually have absolutely no internet. And it's because, not because, Len, I'm the most disciplined writer in the planet. It's because I'm the most undisciplined. And if I have the internet going while I'm writing, I will inevitably, after about 45 minutes, even if I start with the most serious research topic imaginable, I will end up watching shark videos. Yeah. It just <laughs> happened. I don't know why the shark videos always get me. Yeah. So that's why I have to write with the internet completely off, yeah. and Hardy's allows me to do that. How often do uh, fans of your work interrupt you at, at Hardy's, and uh, is that sometimes a plus, or what's sort of the, the experience <laughs> of writing in such a public place? Well, so the beauty, though, is a Hardy's is a kind of place where it's this little small community. It's the same folks every day. They're kind of bored of me, frankly, and they're certainly not all that impressed because they see me every morning in my ratty jeans and my little zip-up writing jacket. I'm really nothing special to them. So they, they just kind of nod over the corner like, oh, yeah, that's our author. No big deal. <laughs> uh, you know, as, as if every Hardy's has an author in residence. Um, so, no, they, they really leave me alone. And every once in a while, someone will come up to me and want to chat or something like that. And I, I will sometimes say, hey, give me a moment. I'm in the middle of a thought here. But then otherwise, I sort of enjoy the interruption. Um, I, I was a journalist for a number of years. And the newsroom is kind of a, a chaotic place where there's always stuff flying around and people screaming and people interrupting you. And I, and I think in Hardee's, I'm almost trying to replicate that environment. I, I, I like a little bit of action when I write. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I noticed you worked briefly f uh, at the Washington Post when you grad graduated mm -hmm. from Dartmouth, and then were, you were at the Star Ledger. Uh, David Ignatius at the Post has got kind of a parallel experience where actually he, I think, published a book while he was writing at the Post, and he had this fork in the road: Do I write books for a career, or do I stay at the Post and somehow try to do right. both? And I think financial obligations to his family and everything led him to say, I think I'm going to stay. And now his writing about the CIA and everything informs his novels. Do you ever wish that you were still at the Star Ledger or another paper so that you were getting kind of a continuous uh, feeding of stories, people, situations that would go into your books? Or are you glad you chose the model of jumping off into the deep end well, of your yeah, books? Well, yeah, you know... Uh Notably, David Ignatius and I are somewhat different ages. Right. Uh, I, I'm 43 years old, so a big part of my calculus was um, I just didn't think the thing was going to last. Uh, unfortunately, and, and it pains me to say that about newspapers, but you, you can read the writing on the wall that, okay, I actually, I think the Washington Post will still be around, but papers like the Newark Star Ledger, which were once a license to print money, are probably not going to be there. And they're certainly not going to be there in the form that I c came to know them and love them. So I, I always said that uh, one year in the newsroom brought you into enough contact with, with material to write at least 20 novels. 
And uh, hopefully, Len, I'll put that to the test over the years. But yeah. uh, yeah, I, I miss – obviously, you miss meeting interesting people and you miss being able to ask them impertinent questions. Uh, and so now I just have to replicate that in my in my own life the best way I can where I'll get into a conversation with a friend and, I, and I'll finally stop them and say, look, I know I have no business asking this question whatsoever, but you know I have books to write. So could you mind giving me some material here? <laughs> I have that conversation all the time. That's a license, yeah. Uh, well, now the the book that's coming out uh, tomorrow, closer than you know, that's your second uh, standalone domestic suspense thriller. Uh, tell us a little bit about the the first one that you published, uh, actually just about a year ago. Right, the first one is called Say Nothing. It, it features a federal judge whose children are kidnapped by someone who is looking to control the outcome of a case he is hearing. So the deal becomes. Give us the verdict we want, and we'll give you your children back. Wow. Now, I'd never heard of a standalone domestic thriller. Is this, have you got a series started of standalone domestic thrillers going here? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can have a series of standalones, Len. I think that, that, that's a contradiction in terms right there. Uh, you know, I've, I've really been enjoying the standalone thing. I, I had six books in the series featuring a, an investigative newspaper reporter, and hopefully I'll come back to them someday. But the beautiful thing about a standalone is, you know, look, a series is essentially a contract with a reader that, among other things, you probably are not going to kill the protagonist, right? Because otherwise there will be no more books. And every once in a while a series writer will kill his protagonist and everybody blows their mind and and, and, and <laughs> stops reading the series. So uh, I think there's always that little safe spot that the protagonist gets to hide in in a series. And that doesn't exist in a standalone. In right. a standalone, I can waste Anybody I want to, I can put them through the worst turmoil imaginable, knowing that I don't have to bring them back for another book. So I, I've sort of been enjoying that lack of safety in the novels. Let's talk a little bit about Carter Ross. That was a, a six-book series starting with right. Faces of the Gone in 2009, and the last so far was The Fraud in 2015. Uh, over that period of time, did your character of Carter Ross uh, evolve, grow up? What, what's he like at the beginning of the series versus where right. you left him off in the thro in the fraud. So it's interesting. Carter kind of is at the beginning of the series this happy go lucky bachelor guy. And when I started writing it, I was well, I had been married for maybe 4 months at that point, but at that point you're still kind of playing with marriage versus toward the end of the series I'm suddenly married, I'm a father of two kids. Life has gotten a lot more serious for me. And not coincidentally, life has started to get more serious for Carter Ross as the series goes along as well. Uh, he is not married, much to his own uh, chagrin, but uh, he, as of uh, book six, he does have a child on the way. And, you know, that, that really changes the stakes in the world for Carter, just as it did for me. So, uh, yes, in case you haven't figured it out, Carter Ross is, is a bit of a Romana Clef for me. <laughs> uh, it, it's been fun to kind of watch him grow up, albeit not grow up too much. He uh -huh. still has a good time. Well, and you say in the in the bio at your website, bradparksbooks.com, that uh, you and Carter share height, weight, eye color, hair color, skin color, charmed upbringing, sartorial blandness, and general worldview. I was it, that led me to wonder: Are there any ways in which you and Carter Ross are different? Uh, yes, I'm left-handed; he's right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the rest is pretty much, uh, as you say, a Romana Clef. Well, and he he has better hair than me too. I mean, I know again, uh, the, your viewers are only listening; they can't. You know, I'm I'm kind of like you know losing, receding. I'm getting more forehead with each year. Uh, Carter Ross has a great hairline. That's right. I, I do have to have some wish fulfillment in here. <laughs> That's right. One thing I noticed, well, is in closer than you know. At one point, you did a fair amount of work to avoid dropping an f bomb in the writing. It says what the <laughs> plots began, then finished the phrase with a vulgar intransitive verb so i searched for that verb in the fraud and there were no results there were no results for the vulgar four-letter word beginning with the letter s there were 26 instances of the word damn and 19 of the word hell so it made me <laughs> wonder what's sort of your strategy on cursing in your writing a long long time ago I had uh, an agent, and this is with my first book, Faces of the Gone, who went through and did a word search. And she found, if I can remember the, it correctly, there were 116 S's and 120 F's in the novel. 
uh, because the novel is set in the newsroom, a place where people are not exactly concerned about curbing their language, and on the streets of Newark, another place where you will hear tough talk. And my agent kind of put it to me very directly. She said, how many people do you think will not buy a book with those words in them? And I said, geez, I, I don't know, maybe 10%, something like that. She said, yeah, you're probably about right. How many people buy books because they have those words in them? And I went, uh, boy, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. She says, you're right. So ask yourself, are you writing to have a broader audience or a narrower audience? And of course, I want a broader audience. So I actually spent one very long morning going through that first manuscript and excising all 116 S and all 120 Fs. Um, and actually, Len, I can report from that experience, the one word that is really difficult to write around is mother effer. That's the <laughs> one that I miss. There, there is no good synonym for mother effer. It is, it is one of those unique and wonderful words in our language um, that, that you just sort of can't do without. But I, I, I've actually had uh, readers email me and, and thank me for not having those words because they don't want to see those words. So that's just kind of become my policy. And yeah, every once in a while I, I miss the stray mother effer. But uh, for the most part, I think readers are glad not to have them in there. Did you come up with a, a pale substitute of mother effer? No, I just every once in a while, if I need it, I, you know, I'll have a line like he he suggested my mother and I had a relationship that I don't <laughs> believe we have or you know, something like that and have yeah. some fun with it so that the savvy reader knows exactly what I'm talking about. But I don't offend the more gentle reader. I think that's brilliant. I, I, I've never heard it stated that clearly as your agent did, but it, that's absolutely true. One thing I noticed in uh, Say Nothing, which is the, the first of the standalone books, uh, the current Kindle price is $1.99. I need to jump in here and say that I misstated that price. It's actually eleven ninety nine for the Kindle version of that book, not one ninety nine. And the current paperback price on at Amazon is eight eighty. So the paperback costs more than the Kindle. Again, I made another error here. The Kindle price is $3.19 more than the paperback price. This is something I hear a lot about from my uh, listeners because we're all ebook readers, and uh, you know we know the, the the major publishers are tending to raise the ebook prices now that they can. But as an author, do you have any sense of you know the people who love reading your books electronically being in kind of a problematic situation when they see the cost of a paperback book, which everybody knows has got to cost at least some more to publish right. than an ebook costing that much more yeah so uh, this is where i actually i feel like we need to have a, a re-education campaign with the reading public because there there's this belief out there that oh it costs nothing to print ergo it should be free and you know what, what people don't realize is the the typical hardcover novel which was you know for years kind of the gold standard of the industry costs 25 dollars right well, it only cost $2.50 to print, ship, and store that novel. The rest of the cost of the novel was actually always the people behind it. It's the author who needs to get paid. It's the editor who needs to get paid. It's the copy editor. It's the salesperson. It's the marketing person. It's all the human beings. You, you really have not been buying a physical product primarily all these years. You have been buying a piece of intellectual uh, copyright content that happens to to be enclosed in a cloth binding. So none of those costs actually change when you take it and make it an electronic book instead of a cloth book. Um, and so that's, that's I think, a, a real difficulty for the industry of, you know, th they need to get better about kind of getting in front of that one and say, hey, look, folks, if you want to read thoughtful novels that have been well edited and well curated and have been given to you with a respect for your time. Let's face it, like, you know, we, this is really the publishing industry saying, we think this book is worth your six to eight hours of your time. You're going to have to pay for that. Um, you know, so I think the the twelve ninety nine ebook strikes people as outrageous at first because yes it doesn't cost them anything well but it does cost and if you want us to be able to continue making these books you know that's kind of the cost you're going to have to bear again it, it it is a piece of intellectual property that the format in which you buy it doesn't really change the price as much as you think it does was that too much of a rant 
Lynn? No, no, no. I, I, it's good to hear that. Uh, I'll, I'll avoid a rant in, in raising one other point, and then I don't want to get stuck here. It seems to me that if uh, an author has done all the work, has gotten paid for the hardcover, and, and the book is, is uh, in existence, and you've got the choice of charging $12 for a Kindle copy or maybe $7, $6, something, and just by what we probably both learned in college, right. supply and demand, if you price it lower, you're going to sell more, and there's going to be more revenue coming to you and Dutton uh, by pricing it at that sweet spot that maximizes the revenue. And I've right. never been able to figure out what would be so bad, having gone through all of the other covering of the cost with the hard cover and sort of the existing model, with this new way of people buying books – enticing more readers to come and read the book that you've spent so much time on by giving them a price that is just going to generate more demand. Right. Well, and and now you are getting into a level of decision making that uh, goes beyond my pay grade. I'm I'm just the dumb guy who writes the book. Somebody else decides how to price them. Uh, and yeah, there isn't. The, yeah, there is a concept in economics of of where are you? And I forget what they call it, but on that that great sliding scale you just mentioned, where are you actually maximizing revenue? And I forget what they call that thing. But um, I'll break in again on our conversation. <laughs> I have to laugh. This is a conversation of two guys who, in college, probably spent more time. Uh, in literature courses than they did on economics, which in my day at Harvard was required. There was a famous Economics 10 class uh, taught by Professor Otto Eckstein. Brad graduated from Dartmouth 24 years after I graduated from Harvard in 1972, but I suspect he probably had to take an economics course as well and that he was exposed and that the supply and demand curve hadn't changed in the way it was taught in, in the 24 years uh, between the t when we were exposed to it. What we were both groping to recall was the concept of equilibrium in pricing. And from Wikipedia, I refreshed my memory today. Generally speaking, an equilibrium is defined to be the price-quantity pair where the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. It is represented by the intersection of the demand and supply curves. Those curves, it's all coming back to me now, represent the idea that at a certain price, suppliers will make a certain number of units or books, but at a higher price that they will get, they will be willing to make more units. By the same token, at a certain price, customers will buy a certain number of books, but if you lower that price, they will buy more books. And the interplay of those two curves picks the point that will maximize the revenue. Uh, it gets pretty tricky if you throw in the idea of marginal costs, which in ebooks are pretty close to zero. And there are lots of other factors that go into the pricing of books, ebooks, or otherwise. What I wanted to suggest to Brad is that at ebook prices of $12, uh, it just seems like there's money being left on the table and that the uh, demand is being suppressed by those high prices. And if it was priced more along a rational model, like I learned in Ec 10 from Otto Eckstein, uh, ebook prices would be lower and there would be more money flowing to the publisher and the authors. We'll return now to the conversation of two non-economics majors who were able to get past this discussion of ebook pricing uh, with the thread of our conversation still intact. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the, the main point that I uh, am encouraged by with publishing, and, and I think about five or six years ago, there was a lot of doom and gloom with publishing of like, oh no, it's going to go the direction of, say, the newspaper, or it's going to be like the music industry. I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I think we're actually probably entering a golden an age where, you know, guess what? You're going to be able to read a book however you best want to read a book. And if that's on your device, God bless you, we're going to make that possible. And if that's in a good old-fashioned hardcover, God bless you, we're going to make that possible. And uh, it's an exciting time for an author because hopefully what it means is my work is more accessible to the public than it has ever been since Johannes Gutenberg first started churning out Bibles. Um, and that's an exciting thing for a writer. Yeah, exactly. I'm also curious about your sense of the self-publishing route. I mean, you've you've had an agent right from the start, and you've published right. traditionally. You spent a lot of time at writers' work uh, conferences talking to writers. What do you tell authors that might be tempted to go that route if they haven't been able to have the success that you've had on the traditional route? Right. You're you're trying to get me in trouble here, aren't you? No, no. You're just you know like I. And if I were if I were smarter, I would probably just find a way to dance around this question. But I'm actually not that smart. So uh, honestly, what I see. It, uh, 
please don't misunderstand me. There are some great self-published titles out there. There are some authors who have very clear-eyed decided this is the direction I want to go, and God bless them. I I think that's wonderful. Um, Unfortunately, what I do see a lot of is authors who are impatient, frankly. They want their book to get published. They're desperate to be read, and so they, they rush out a product that is maybe not yet ready for prime time, And one of the things I've learned, sometimes the hard way about this business, is you really only get one chance to make a first impression. So you've got to make that first impression as good as it can be. And, you know, we're all on on a learning curve as authors. I mean, I, I like to think eight books in, I'm still getting better with every single book. And you're in an especially steep part of that curve, say, with books one, two, and three. Uh, The dirty little secret of writing is that almost no author I've ever met has actually published their first manuscript. Generally, that, that, quote, debut novel is the second or third or fourth or, heck, I've got friends, it's their ninth Mm. manuscript that they've completed, right? And I think those those manuscripts that stay in the proverbial door, they're learning a lot during that, and they're, they're growing in their craft, and they're just getting better at what they do. And so I sometimes think self-published authors don't realize that conventionally published authors have gone through this, this long process, and that that can be, although it's amazingly frustrating at the time, it can also be a really good thing for you because ultimately it's the quality of the final product that matters. And is the quality actually improved by being self-published? A lot of times, unfortunately, the answer is no. And that's – that's I'm ending there, Len. OK. I've, I've said enough stupid things no, uh, no, about I, that. I, I think I'm that's – stop there. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean you know, I, I went through the MFA program at Bennington and I've sort of experienced that impatience that right. uh, MFA writers have to get published. And I, I, think, I think you make a really good point that that, that door to self-publishing is, is very tempting. And if you have the discipline or whatever other reasons to wait for the more traditional route, uh, it really could en- enhance the quality of your writing. And that's what everybody's after to begin with. So I think that's a fair point. Yeah. And it, it, it is, again, though, it's exciting to have more options. Yeah. And it, it's exciting to have voices. And I, I think the wonderful thing about self-publishing is it, it does allow some books to come into the field that would otherwise not be read and would not be heard. And, and I certainly know I have some conventionally published friends who will self-publish a title here and there just because they feel like, you know what, this is not for the big publishing house that I write for, but I still want this book to have an audience, to, to you know, to find that little niche audience that I imagine for it. And I, I, so I think it's great that it's an option. Uh, no, it's just not an option, obviously, I've chosen for myself. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's turn back to, to literature. I've enjoyed some of your comments about the problems with modern literature but but you're obviously a, a big fan of Mark Twain, and I'm wondering when <laughs> I've been reading this great biography of Mark Twain. He he started out as a journalist as well. It was sort of a different kind of journalism right. out west, pretty pretty wild stuff. But what do you think you've learned from him on the the best way to tell a great story? You know, I, I think really from from Twain, it's it really just is the enduring power of the great story. And, and I don't know if I can be more specific or, or articulate than that. I, I guess I, I look for things in story that are universal, that will that will stand the test of time. And, and Twain's stories, even though they're obviously set in a specific time and in a, in a specific place, still have that kind of universality about them. And um, I, I guess I, I look at certain authors and – that are greatly esteemed in the moment as as literature, right? But I, I think, frankly, and again, I'm going to get myself in trouble, man. Len, you are just – you're bad news. You know, I think a lot of what passes as literature today will not stand the test of time because there's no story in the story. You know, you have 350 pages of a character examining his navel and, and and having, you know, interior monologue. And that's just not the stuff that's going to endure. I mean, I, I think of like, if, though he has not won a National Book Award and probably never will, Stephen King is still going to be read 100 years from now. I, I don't know if you can always say that about the National Book Award winner. Now, Let's be clear, this year's winner, Jesmyn Ward, wrote a wonderful, wonderful book that actually does have a lot of story in it and, and is wonderful. Sing Unburied Sing. I love that novel. But I, I, I so often see that that prized literary you know, book that, again, just doesn't have anything happening. And I think readers want books where things happen. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what Twain's novels are. And, and certainly I think that's what the thriller genre is. Uh, and that's why I'm a delighted practitioner of that genre. You've also been uh, compared uh, with Dave Barry, the gifted <laughs> storyteller with shades of Mark Twain or maybe Dave Barry. Who, who, who do you resonate most closely with between that pair? <laughs> so, yeah, the Dave Barry thing is funny. Or I've, I've been compared to Janet Ivanovich or, uh, you know, kind of some other humorous authors. And I, I think that's probably – my characters sometimes will crack wise. I mean, look, I was born in New Jersey, Len. Sarcasm is like the state language. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think, you know, if anything, I have I've probably toned that down some in my writing over the the course of of eight novels, uh, because I've realized that when you are laughing, you are not feeling suspense. And I am ultimately looking to make you feel suspense. Uh, So I've really, you know, for as much as I, you know, had that little funny chapter that I read at the beginning of of this broadcast about, you know, Lord Voldemort and all that other kind of stuff. uh, For the most part, once I get into a novel, I am now consciously trying not to be funny because I feel like it gets in the way of what I'm really trying to accomplish. Yeah, makes sense. Well, let's finish up with New Jersey. Uh, Newark, uh, you, uh, your Carter Ross novels are set in, in Newark, and uh, someone talked said that if you read these stories, you'd, you'd never dare go to Newark. But you, <laughs> you say some nice things about Newark, too. And Newark is surprisingly one of the 20 cities left in, under consideration for Amazon's second headquarters, the HQ2. Right. Oh, and, and I'm, I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for him. Well, what what pitch would you make on behalf of Newark, uh, given that you've described so many aspects of Newark, which are a little scary? Well, so, uh, you know, Newark's great advantage to Amazon would simply be it is a small island of affordability within the New York metropolitan region. Uh, And it also has great transportation because when so many of our transportation hubs, you know, with trains and whatnot were being established, Newark was an industrial powerhouse that people needed to get to. Um, So there's obviously a a very uh, well-educated populace very nearby. And uh, I, I think it would just be a great story for Newark, you know, something that would really help it bring back if, you know, this this kind of aging, decaying industrial city was able to seize on to something that was obviously so very 21st century. Uh, and that, you know, I have a lot of friends left in Newark and, mm. and it would be a huge win for them. I'd love well, to see it. Uh, I think there's some parallel with Audible because Audible really committed to Newark and its growth right. has all been right there in, in uh, Newark. So. I think that would be a very satisfying choice, if, although I'm pulling for Boston and Denver, the two places I live. But Newark, <laughs> Newark would really be a story if that's yeah. They Newark, ended up. Newark needs the help a little more than Denver, let's face or it. Or Boston, know, Denver, yeah. 300 days of sunshine a year. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to hear about Denver being hard on its luck. Exactly. And, you know, in Boston, you've got the Patriots going to the Super Bowl every year. No, Newark definitely needs the help more. I would say so. Can you tell us anything about your next book and when it will be published? Uh, Yeah, so it's called – well, tentatively at this point, it is titled The Last Act, um, and it is – it features an out-of-work actor who is hired by the FBI to help bring down a cartel. And he does this by posing as an inmate going to a prison and trying to cozy up to a former cartel money launderer and getting the money launderer to leak documents to him. Mm. And things go terribly wrong from there, as, <laughs> as is the case with all of my novels. As you could imagine. I have been speaking with Brad Parks, the author of Closer Than You Know, which will be published tomorrow, March 6th, by Dutton, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Thanks very much, Brad, and good luck with the book. Len, thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. In content, I want to pass along a recommendation from listener Mark Roberts. He wrote me about an author, Caitlin Dunnett, and she has a series. It's the Liss McCrimmon series, which have a Scottish-American heritage theme to them. I bought the first one, Kilt Dead. I like the writing. It's it's light, it's nice, but it's very clean. It's it's a very well written, and I was happy to see that the, this first part of the series was set in a fictitious main town named Mustukaluk. Uh, there's a lot of main towns that have the the, the name Moose in them, so it, that it was pleasant. And uh, Liss returns to heal her wounded knee after she fell during a Scottish dancing performance. By the end of Chapter 3, a body is discovered beneath a bolt of the Flower of Scotland fabric in her aunt's store. Uh, I haven't met the Scotty yet. That was a big draw for Mark because uh, he has a, 
uh, a much loved Scotty Carson, who I met last time we got together at South by Southwest. He also put me on to a list of cozy mysteries uh, that have dogs in them, including two that have Yorkies. And I'll have a link in the show notes to that list. If, if you've got a favorite dog and you want to read a mystery to them that has uh, their breed in it, this is the place that you'll be able to do it. Uh, That's it for this week. Next week's show will bring you intro to outro South by Southwest voices and ideas. Uh, And in the weeks to come, I've got some good shows uh, scheduled, including Otis Chandler, co-founder and CEO of Goodreads, who will be with us for TKC 504 on March 30th. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Denver, headed to Austin. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my show. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.